Uh, I'm going to be talking about real craftsmen can create their own tools. Um, I'm going to be going extremely fast on this. Uh, thus far, I've, I've been averaging coming in about 10 to 12 minutes under time. Uh, this is also known as create your own code climate. Um, first off, thank you everyone for sticking it out to the end of the day. Uh, there's been a lot of really good talks, and I'm sure that brains are probably a bit fried, uh, but I'm here to tell you that I'm not going to be helping you out with that. Uh, we got 150 slides in 30 minutes. It's about five slides a minute. Uh, it's a semi-technical talk. It's not as much code as I would like to have, uh, but there's still plenty of code. The slides are already published at that URL, and you can twit me at the underscore Zen spider. So let's get this out of the way. Um, this can be part of the drinking game for those of you who are watching this at home on Confreaks. Um, my tick is, um, so every time I say um, you can take a drink or whatever you're currently imbibing in, because uh, there will be more. Um, I really like the first talk today. Uh, it said something that I've been trying to say for years over and over, so please repeat after me. You are not your code. Again, one more time. Thank you. If you take anything from this conference to heart, please take that. So let's get started. I firmly believe that at least 90% of the time, software engineering is a lie. Sure, if you work for NASA or JPL or, and I swear I had this slide uh, last week, rocket surgery, um, yeah, you're doing engineering. But if you're working on websites, or DevOps, or like my crappy open source projects, uh, you're not doing engineering. Uh, hell no, you're not doing engineering. Uh, we may write software, but it's not even close to what other people consider engineering. And I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to be insulting with that, it's quite the opposite, because engineering can be really boring. I mean, do you really want your job to be fitting a bunch of Legos together all day long? I mean, unless it's real Legos, I don't want that job. We're craftsmen. We craft software. And when I refer to craftsmen, I'm using it in a plural, gender-inclusive form. I mean every one of us and everyone in our field. So we cut, we chisel, we sand our code, we fit it together. And as a quick aside, uh, this artist is amazing. Uh, everyone, when you leave this Faraday cage, should uh, look at this website. Um, the static pictures do nothing. These are, these are kinesthetic wooden uh, sculptures, and they're beautiful. They do nothing to show off the beauty of these things. So uh, if you're ever in Seattle and you want to see some of these at work, please drop me a line. Um, like good work, woodworking, each piece is unique. When we're crafting, sometimes you need a unique tool specialized to a specific task, uniquely suited to how you work or what you're doing. This is Bertha. It's Seattle's tunnel boring machine. Yes, Seattle, woo. Uh, it's five stories tall and is currently the largest tunnel boring machine in the world. It is a specialized tool for a specific task. So you make these tools, right? Right? Well, you should. Or at the very least, you should be able to. Now, I'm not saying you should always write a custom tool. Um, don't use every tool you have access to. Don't install every gem you could possibly download. Use the right tool for the job, but sometimes that does need to be a custom tool. Unfortunately, this isn't a widely adopted practice. Why is that? I blame Algol. Or at least I blame the history of Algol-based languages. C, C++, Pascal, Ada, etc. I certainly don't expect you to read or understand this. I certainly don't. Um, did any, has anyone coded an algol? Good. Um, so as I was researching this, uh, you might notice on the, the line that starts with real that there's a uptick logo, and lower down there's a signal for downtick. Those are matrix operations. And I don't quite understand this code, and I don't really want to. But yeah, we could have been doing this. This could have been an algol conference. A more relevant example, here's quick sort in C. I've cleaned it up a lot in order to fit it on uh, a slide and still be readable. Uh, these just demonstrate some of the complexities of these languages. They're static, they're opaque, they don't provide introspective abilities built into the language. 
code, th this type of code can't reason about itself. If you can think about thinking, why can't these languages reason about their own code? They have complex grammars. They have complex semantics. And to be fair, Ruby has one of the most complex grammars I've worked with. Complex memory models. And quite frankly, it's disempowering. Tool making is for the elite. With the usual tools of Yak and Lex to do LALR parsing, the bar is set even higher because you don't even write in the same language you're trying to analyze the tools you want to use. More relevant, if you use a programming editor, programmable editor, many of us may use these things, but fewer actually program in VimScript or Elisp to meet your specific needs. Fewer still will write tools specific to helping them code in some way. I've always wondered why we don't do everything we can to make our jobs easier, to make our tools more powerful, and to have them work for us rather than against us. And hope that this talk makes approaching this task a little bit easier. So let's jump in, the deep end. Let's get started with language tools. I've written several, uh, but I'm gonna be focusing on Flog and Flay. You can see more about them at that URL. So has anyone heard of Flog? That's awesome, I really like that. So Flog, in its simplest description, analyzes complexity. More specifically, it implements uh, what's called an ABC metric, which uh, stands for assignments, branches, and calls. So here we have a lame example uh, where we have a method blah that assigns to A the result of an eval and then tests that against a certain value and prints something if it comes out truthy. And in this case, Flog has domain-specific knowledge about Ruby. Uh, it assigns uh, every node in this parse tree a specific score and sums them up. And in this case, it gives blah a score of 11.2. Flay, on the other hand, reports structurally similar code. Humans are really good at pattern matching. So when we look at this code, we see the methods X and Y. We see that they have different method names. They have different coding styles. In this case, I use parens on the first one and not on the second one. Uh, they have different argument names and they have different literal values. But you can very quickly pattern match this and see that they are structurally similar. And that's what Flay reports. Flay can also report fuzzily similar code uh, code that is structurally similar to another piece, but it might have something added or something removed. It can still consider those uh, similar. So the basic architecture of a programming or language analysis tool, uh, first thing that must be said is that this is not a tool for regular expressions. There's only so much that you can do using something that expects a regular language to analyze something that is not a regular language. The tool needs to be able to know the language. It needs to be able to build a model of whatever code it's analyzing, and it needs to be able to walk that model, such that if we have input source, like this three plus four times two, it will tokenize the stream into three plus four times and two, and then because it knows about uh, literals, numeric literals three, four, and two, and because it knows that plus and star are method calls and those have varying levels of precedence, it knows to build an internal model that looks like this, it might be structured like this internally. Call plus, lit three, call star, lit four, lit two. And to build those models, we use Ruby parser. Uh, it parses from 1.8 all the way up to 2.0. Uh, 2.1 will come as soon as someone submits those patches. And it converts something like this into a structure like this, which we can represent in code like this. This is one to one the same as this diagram. It is the call on lit three, the message plus, the argument, which is the result of the call of lit four, the message star, and the lit two. To walk those models, we use SexP processor. It dispatches based on node type. If you wanted to walk that tree, you could implement my language tool, subclass SexP processor, and define those two methods that, while it's walking the tree, will dispatch to them automatically and pass the subtree down. So let's look at how Flog works. Flog knows Ruby. Uh, so it starts off with a hash that defaults its value to one for every node and uh, has specific knowledge about things that are more complex, more risky, uh, or more costly. So we know that sends and class evals uh, 
uh, includes, extends, and those types of things, they're riskier constructs or they're more costly constructs, so it gives it a higher score or an extra penalty. It then defines a bunch of process methods, uh, and in this case we have process if, it adds the score to branching, since that is the category that it falls into. It's not a call and it's not an assignment, it's a branch. It analyzes by recursing uh, the condition of the if statement, and then it analyzes via recursion the true case and the false case, if any. Calls uh, would recurse and process the receiver, get the name, recurse and process all the arguments, and then record that against the name of the method that was called in the first place so that they get grouped together and you can see uh, how um, costly a given call is. And then there's process methods for all the other different types of assignments and all the other different types of branches, and then that one method takes care of all the calls. Flay, for something as complex as it is, the ability to work language independently, the ability to ignore method names, argument names, literal values, string values, all those things, that's the algorithm, really. We start off by getting a sexp to analyze, we ask for its structure, we get the hash value of that. We then bin that sexp under that hash value with other similarly structured items, and at the end of the run, we walk through this hash and anything that has multiple values gets reported because they have similarly structured code across it. So, how would we make our own language analysis tool using Ruby Parser and SexP Processor? Let's start with something like Lint. Lint, historically, is a command line tool that analyzes uh, KNR and ANSI C code for semantic and idiomatic uh, errors or warnings across the code. We'll start small. We'll start very small. We'll start by reporting single character variables. We're gonna do this TDD. So we go ahead and require a test auto run. We require lint. We describe lint. We do nothing with it. For the sake of time, even though I'm gonna have plenty, um, I'm gonna go ahead and define a cert lint that takes some source code to analyze and some expected output. It's gonna instantiate a new instance of lint and a new instance of Ruby parser, parse that source into a sexp, and then tell lint to process it and assert that the output is what we expect it to be. Um, in all following examples, any nude code that I add that doesn't take up an entire slide is gonna be bolded so that it pops. We're gonna add the happy path such that compliant code is completely silent. We're gonna add the sad path such that a single character variable, a equals one, is going to output short variable A on file.rb line one. We're gonna add some infrastructure just to avoid uh, some extra slides on name errors and stuff like that. We're gonna define class lint, subclassing method-based sexp processor, <clears throat> and some simple driver code that instantiates a new lint, walks over all the files on the command line, and processes each one. And in doing so, we get our first red. The silent case, the happy path, is happy because the code doesn't do anything, therefore it doesn't output anything, and we can ignore it at this stage. But the sad path is sad. We expect to see short variable A on file.rb line one, and we see nothing. So we define process LAssign, LAssign being the node type of local variable assignment. We destructure the sexp into the name and value. We don't actually care about the value, we just want the name. And then we assign to error, uh, the string short variable if it actually matches the regular expression of a single dot. If there's an error, it outputs it, and then it moves on. This is gonna process things immediately. I'm not gonna store it for later in order to build a pretty report. It's simply just gonna spew as soon as it hits something. And that gets us our first wall of dots. So, we know we can add more functionality now. We have the uh, infrastructure that we need for the testing side and the implementation side, we have our first set of dots. So we're gonna add the ability to detect global names and instance variable names um, and actually class variable names, but I didn't add a test for that. These two tests fail and we extend our regular expression only to allow for a literal dollar, an at or an at at, make those optional 
followed by the single dot and nothing more. Right, but process LSI is only for local variables. We have different node types for globals and different node types for instance variables. So we need to attach those uh, process methods. So we refactor, and we rename process LSI to simply var, and we alias var to both uh, process LSI, ISI, and GSI. And that gets us a wall of green. So now that we know this works, we can now go ahead and start analyzing different types of things. In this case, let's report camel case variables because as Rubyists, we hate these. So we add a new test. A thing equals one should output bad variable name, a thing on file.rb line one. We get a red. We extend the case statement with a second regular expression such that it can have one or more lowercase uh, letters followed by an uppercase letter and whatever else follows that. That will assign error to bad variable name, which will then output and get us a wall of dots. True to form, we're gonna extend those tests to allow for global variables and instance variables. Uh, they're structurally exactly the same. The only thing that changes is A to A thing. We get our failures. We extend the regular expression in the exact same way, and we get a wall of dots. Really, it's this simple, and really it took about this long to write. So what did we do? We wrote seven tests. We wrote one happy path and two sets of three sad path tests. And we wrote roughly 50 lines of implementation where the meat is all right here. It's easy to test. It's easy to extend. If you keep going, you can hook in Flay for complexity analysis, or maybe you want to write a cyclomatic complexity analyzer yourself. You can use Flay for refactoring an analysis. You can implement a simple dependency analyzer. You can assign numeric scores to those things so you can give it an overall grade of A to F. And sooner or later, you can take on code climate. Probably later. Those guys have put hundreds if not thousands of hours into what they've done and they've really polished it and done a really good job of it. But it really is this simple to make a similar tool. And since I assume I have plenty of time one more thing. In 2011, I chided you for using grocery store ground pepper uh, and said you should use fresh black pepper instead. 2012, I gave you my recipe for ginger ale, and this year, I'm gonna give you my recipe for hot sauce. Um, Aja, I actually forgot to bring mine up. Can you bring it up? Start with any type of pepper you like. Roughly chop them, add them to a pressure cooker, Bring it up to pressure, 15 PSI, for one minute, and use the natural least method. That means let it go down uh, in pressure by simply cooling on its own. Transfer it to a blender and roughly puree it. And it really is that simple. Uh, in approximately five minutes, including bringing the pressure cooker up to temp, um, you can, uh, make your own hot sauce that side by side tastes much better than sriracha. Um, and I have a bottle. <laughs> Anyone who wants to try some, please grab me and uh, we can put it on the cookies or whatever and you can try it. <laughs> Thank you.